Okay, thank you very much for the introduction, Michael, and thank you all for turning up this afternoon. Um, so my name is Cheryl Lother. I'm a lecturer in criminology at Queen's, and with my colleagues, Professor Kieran McAvoy and Lauren Dempster, we have been working on a project for the past couple of years on the intersection between dealing with the past and the experience and the politics of victimhood in Northern Ireland. So what we wanted to do today was to focus on three themes that have shaped that project. The themes of voice, agency and blame, and consider how those themes and the experience of those themes may be played out in respect to the consultation on the Stormont House Agreement, but also on the establishment and the life cycle of any of the legacy bodies. So to start off, I wanted to give you a bit of background to the project, have a brief look at the context or the backdrop and against which we have been working on these issues, have a look at just a very brief look at the research methods to see what we've been up to over the last couple of years, and then focus in on the more substantive issues. And when we get to that part of the presentation, you'll see that we've tried to allow as many victims' voices as possible to speak. We wanted to convey individuals' experiences and individual perspectives to you today. So to start off with just a bit of background on the project, you can see the formal title of the project there on the screen. So it's Voice, Agency and Blame, Victimhood and the Imagined Community in Northern Ireland. And we are a two and a half year funded project by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So we're finishing up in September 2018. Um, and just to give you a bit of extra information, well, you can see our project website address is there, so you're free to have a look at the website. But if anyone has any questions or any queries about what you've heard today, please feel free to drop me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. I also just wanted to draw to your attention, on the 14th of May, we're hosting a project conference in Riddle Hall at Queen's. Registration is still open and there's still a number of spaces available. So if anyone is interested in coming along on that day to hear a bit more about the project, but also the wider international and Northern Ireland context, we would very much like to see you there. And if you just follow the link on the project website, you can register for the conference. So in terms of the context against which we designed this project in 2015, that context was essentially twofold. One being, as you know, was the context of the ongoing debate in Northern Ireland on how best to deal with the past. So on the one hand, we have the uh, existence of a large number of different mechanisms designed to offer some degree of truth recovery or justice or acknowledgement for victims and survivors. What effectively constitutes the piecemeal approach to the past? So be that the Office of the Police Ombudsman, be that investigations in the coroner's courts or grassroots efforts at truth recovery, for example. But effectively running alongside those initiatives in parallel have been several substantive attempts to try to get a coherent, overarching approach to dealing with the legacy of the conflict. Um, and you can see the different approaches that have been set out there on the screen. So whether that's running from 2006 with Healing Through Remembering's report on options for truth recovery in and about Northern Ireland, through to 2009 on the consultative group in the past. Again, as you will all know, the consultative group in the past efforts faltered on the, the proposal to pay a recognition payment to all victims and survivors. Then in 20 th yeah, 2013, we had the involvement of Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan, but again, negotiations broke down at the 11th hour. But of course, the issue of dealing with the past and responding to victims and survivors' needs doesn't go away with the passage of time. So effectively, where we are now is sitting uh, and waiting to see what progress comes out of the Stormont House Agreement or the Fresh Start Agreement in terms of the proposed consultation. So just to recap, what the agreement proposes on dealing with the past are this, the creation of four distinct legacy bodies. So that's the Historical Investigations Unit, the Independent Commission on Information Retrieval, the Oral History Archive and the Implementation and Reconciliation Group. You can find much more detail on all of those mechanisms in the text of the agreement or online, which is readily available. As you said, that is part of the context in which we're working and part of the conversation that we hope to inform today. The second sort of aspect or backdrop to our work has been the ongoing politicisation of victimhood in Northern Ireland. Um, so 
probably the, one of the major sites of contest around who is a victim of the Northern Ireland conflict is the still contested Victims and Survivors Order of 2006, which provides a legal definition of a victim or survivor. Um, and that debate over who can be thought of as a victim or survivor, we often see it being played out in the media or in other forums through notions of innocent victims or guilty victims or who can be or should people be considered deserving or non-deserving victims or you know, the question of do we have a hierarchy of victims or actually should we have a hierarchy of victims, for example. But that plays out in a number of practical ways. So we saw it in 2009 when the Consultative Group on the Past's recommendation for a recognition payment fell apart on the politics of victimhood and meant that despite the fact it was one of 31 recommendations in that report, the, rec the report has effectively been gathering dust since that point in time. Also thinking about more in terms of the present day, there is a proposal for a pension and a considerable amount of work has been done around the a pension for those who were seriously injured as a result of the conflict. But again, the fact that it is payable to all victims and survivors has proved a sticking point and that there is a small number of individuals who were harmed by their own actions during the conflict would also receive that pension. So that again has provided a stumbling block on the politics of victimhood. But we also don't need to go too far to see where the politics of victimhood plays out on a daily basis. I think it wouldn't, we wouldn't need to look too far beyond uh, a newspaper on a daily basis to see some contest over the past and over who is rightfully or un unrightfully considered a victim of the conflict. So that is the backdrop to the work, or the, the backdrop to our work. So that ongoing debate on dealing with the past and the constant politics of victimhood. So in terms of what we did then, um, we obviously submitted a, a grant application in, in 2015 and we're very fortunate that we were successful with that. Um, and really thinking about our theme of voice, we are qualitative researchers, we're not quantitative researchers, so everything we have done has been based around semi-structured interviews with about 60 representatives and members of victims groups from right across Northern Ireland but also victim representatives, so lawyers or NGO activists, for example, or members of the statutory sector who are involved in directly delivering services to victims and survivors, or policy makers as well. As an aside to what we're talking about today, we're also creating guidelines, media guidelines, on how best victims and survivors can engage with the media, but also how journalists and other media professionals can represent I will ethically represent legacy issues. So we've also engaged with a range of print and broadcast journalists as well. Um, we didn't attempt to be geographically representative of Northern Ireland in terms of the distribution of our research sample. Um, but we were considerably aided in terms of access to interviews as we partnered uh, with the Commission for Victims and, Sur and Survivors early on in the research. We wanted to ensure given that these issues around victims or around apologies or the disappeared are such sensitive and vulnerable issues, we wanted to ensure that we were always working to the best possible standards. So we've had a critical friend within the Commission who has looked over our research questions, so the questions that we would go out and ask interviewees. They um, also have contributed around the, work, the creation of the media guidelines, but also importantly, they were able to facilitate access to a very wide range of individuals. Because what we didn't want to do was just interview the same people that are interviewed again and again and repeat the same experiences. We wanted to branch out and reach as many people as possible. Um, so about 21 of our interviewees were women, um, and we really called time <laughs> I suppose, on the actual active research phase of the project, when we got to the point of what we would term research saturation, in that you were starting to actually just repeat the same data over and over again. But in addition to our field work, we also, um, and it wasn't something that we intended to do at the outset of the project, we also were interested in how victimhood is constructed in the public sphere. So myself and, and Kieran and Lauren uh, went on as many walking tours 
around Belfast or around other areas of Northern Ireland as we could, to explore local experiences of conflict and victimisation um, and the impact on local communities, or actually just to stand in the space of different atrocity sites and see how those sites intersect with the rest of the landscape. So we have tried to go as broad as we possibly can with this project. Um, and what we want to do today with looking at the substantive findings is to really allow you to see what our interviewees were saying to us. So moving on in terms of our for first theme then of victim voice. If we think internationally for a moment or we think about what happens in transitional, just, transitional context or post-conflict countries, a lot of time, there's a lot of emphasis put on the fact that there's a real complexity and a multiplicity of victims' voices in the aftermath of conflict. It's not just one voice, and it's not just one experience, and we should never be naive to think that it is that way. But there's also emphasis put on, for example, the importance of hearing and acknowledging victims' voices, but also the role that voice and hearing different people's experiences and perspectives can play in broadening out our understanding of the past. And I think the fieldwork for this project really um, correlated with those themes. Those issues are very much alive and present in Northern Ireland. But on the other hand, there are a number of challenges associated with voice and its relationship to truth recovery or dealing with the past more broadly. The first one of those challenges that we wanted to draw your attention to today is some of our interviewees express concern that sometimes in, in Northern Ireland, as in many other countries across the world, victims' voices or vulnerable voices sometimes can be effectively picked out uh, and projected into the political sphere, often sometimes for political ends or for reasons that don't necessarily progress victims and survivors in terms of their own individual healing or meeting their own individual needs. And sometimes, as one of our, some of our interviewees pointed out to us, sometimes it's actually the volume at which those voices are played out, which is problematic. Um, and you can see that here on the top quotation. It's kind of like the loudest voice, the sharpest elbows, the biggest who pushes their way to the top of the queue. So for some of our interviewees, that practice around the volume and selectivity of voices is very problematic. But as one of our other interviews uh, also emphasised, and again coming back to this issue of selection and visibility of individual and group voices, the, sh this interview was really clear that we needed to encourage different voices into the public sphere to, to the extent that individuals and groups are comfortable with that, of course. But also it's important to broaden out the narration of the past and broaden out the depth and the complexity of what we understand about the conflict in Northern Ireland. And you can see that here in this interview statement. I'll just give you a second to read that. But just to, to move on, the contrast to this expression of voice and a, an expression of voice at top volume is actually the silencing of what some of our interviewees termed uncomfortable voices. And those uncomfortable voices, for example, could be voices which challenge understandings or constructions of the past, or maybe they challenge privileged notions around innocence and blame. Um, and while the quote on the screen there refers to members of the Republican community who have been victims of Republican violence, the same is equally true of those members of the Unionist or Loyalist community who have been victims of state violence. Because their experience is so challenging to themselves, but also to the understanding of the conflict that is prevalent within their community, you're at an automatic disadvantage, because where do you go with that very difficult and that very challenging story? So as this statement on the screen demonstrates here then, I think there's a, a very pressing need to really interrogate and identify where these, these uncomfortable voices are and why and how such voices are silenced and effectively marginalised in a post-conflict society. 
Closely related to the theme of voice, then, is the theme of agency. And obviously, we say this in full acknowledgement that there are, of course, those victims and survivors who need help and assistance and very much welcome the help and support from those with the skills and the resources to do so. But we are also, <coughs> during the fieldwork, we were very much made aware of the critique that is sometimes made against the victim sector, if you like, in Northern Ireland, that as the prevalence of, of victims groups and services has expanded, it hasn't necessarily always been met by a parallel commitment to advance the voice and the agency of victims. And again, this issue isn't unique to Northern Ireland. But what is problematic is when victims groups, in the words of one of our interviewees, become more about the group than about the victim. Um, or at least as a second statement, demonstrates down there, actually the third bullet point demonstrates there. For one of our interviews, they're very critical of the idea that sometimes in some places, and not of course in all organisations or service providers, but there appears to be individuals who actually don't have a genuine moral or intrinsic interest in responding to victims' needs. Also, for some, some interviewees, and has been sort of expressed elsewhere in Northern Ireland, there's this argument that this, this expansion of services and personnel has created something of a victim's industry in Northern Ireland. And that was not discussed by our interviewees in positive terms at all. Um, and in fact, one um, member of the, of one individual who was vict a victim as a result of the conflict in Northern Ireland, they have publicly gone on the record to critique the little lot of grip groups looking for grants who are like vultures feeding on the dead and the injured. And this person themselves is heavily involved in the design and the delivery of services to victims and survivors. Also, um, as you can see from the statement there on the screen from the um, former Victims Commissioner, Sir Kenneth Bloomfield, there is a need in his argument to move people away um, from a, a, sense of, or a sense of victimhood or a sense of victim's industry that can sometimes entrench individuals within vict a victim identity rather than cultivating agency and empowerment. So I think we think in light of the upcoming consultation on the Stormont House Agreement, and, um, there needs to be a careful balance then between representing and advocating for victims and survivors, but also denying or curtailing individuals of their agency. The final theme that we want to, actually sorry, I'm just actually gone on one too far. Um, that said, that's presenting a very negative perspective on agency and the use of, on the work of, of groups and organizations. But other interviewees were, uh, correctly so, very quick to offer a ready acknowledgement of the sense of ownership and empowerment that can come from cultivating agency and actually kind of getting up and doing your thing and advocating for yourself or for your community. Um, as you can see on the statement there. Okay, so moving on, the final theme that we wanted to discuss today in this briefing paper is about the relationship between victimhood and blame. Um, and actually, as really neatly captured by one of our interviewees, in Northern Ireland, we are not immune to playing the blame game. Um, in fact, as this interview pointed out, we actually have a TV show called The Blame Game. We're so kind of attached to this notion of blaming one another. Um, but that kind of humorous point aside with the way the interview expressed it around the blame game actually points to some real challenges around the establishment of legacy bodies in that there is a danger that the creation, for example, of a historical investigations unit or the ICIR or oral history, that these could become forms for the institutionalisation of blame and the institutionalisation of whataboutery that we are often so quick to revert to in Northern Ireland. Um, and I think what you can see, we can already sometimes see this, that when, for example, 
a campaign has been successful or an individual has been successful in their quest for truth or justice, sometimes that is immediately countered in the press by someone else or another campaign saying, oh, but my truth is better than yours, or my, the atrocity that affected my family or my community, it's more significant, so therefore our truth is more important. So sometimes there's a sense of like a jostling for who has the best truth or who has the truest truth about the conflict. And I think just as there's conversations on do we have a hierarchy of victimhood, actually we may be in danger of straying into conversations about do we or should we have a hierarchy of truths. So I think there's three kind of key consequences to that then. One potentially negative consequence in terms of the Stormont House Agreement and the establishment of the relevant legacy bodies is that truth or the recovery of truth simply becomes another forum in which the, in inverted commas, the war is fought by other means. In terms of, for example, headline cases or certain voices are therefore at risk of being picked out and reappropriated to suit particular causes. But it can also mean that truth recovery becomes individualized. So it, instead of focusing on the broader context, the causes and the consequences of what happened here in Northern Ireland, we stick with the individual appropriation of innocence and guilt. But also thirdly, reverting to practices of blaming means it's impossible to create the space for political generosity that is required to push the peace process and the political landscape forward. Instead, there is a real risk. I think we think that victimhood and the victim identity remain at risk of stagnation and perhaps even reification. And ultimately, those kind of practices, they don't do anything to foster a true unpicking of the past or to further our capacity to respond to the needs of victims and survivors. So today we're very aware that we can only offer you a snapshot of the interview data that's been captured by this project. Um, but we have sought to highlight some of the most salient issues <coughs> emerging from that research in respect to the themes of voice, agency and blame. Um, and we consider those themes to be very influential or potentially influential in respect to the upcoming consultation on the legacy aspects of the Stormont House Agreement and ultimately the establishment and potential life cycle of those bodies. Um, so we think that said, these issues around voice, agency and blame, these are not, they're challenging issues, but they're issues that are not effectively new to Northern Ireland or to other transitional jurisdictions. But they do need careful consideration. They also need sensitivity and imagination and a degree of generosity going forward. Thank you.